Welcome to the Utility Supercluster here. My name is Pete Saronis, and I'm super excited today to feature my friend and colleague, Mr. Greg Bell from the company Corelight. He's the co-founder and chief strategy officer at Corelight. What's exciting today is uh, before I get to read about you, uh, Greg, and, and have you talk a little bit or fill in those gaps is that this super cluster for those watching today, uh, we call it the super cluster because it truly is a convening of folks internationally to come together and on occasion, like we do every quarter, feature a thought leader like yourself, Greg, but also the company, the culture and how the technology that you've developed is absolutely a component of what it takes to build a smart city, a city that is underpinned by infrastructure and things we don't see, but ultimately, provides that blanket of security, both cyber and physical, uh, to whatever city is looking to adopt uh, the technology. So, um, you know, Greg, before uh, um, I allow you to kind of just give a little more fill in the gap there, I, I want to remind folks that, you know, the super cluster born out of, in 2014, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology through its Global Cities Teams Challenge, uh, really ignited the private or commercial sector to kind of create and form these, these clusters, these opportunities, whether it's in transportation, energy, water, waste management, we're the utility super cluster that is. And what we really try to do is feature that curiosity, the human spirit, the passion that, that is brought to bear, not just because there's a requirement, but because we believe that you know internationally and globally we're digitally connected. So we're super excited to have you today, Greg. We'll talk a little bit more about the super cluster, but I think you understand today it's, uh, it's a bit technology, it's a bit humanity. As I like to say, let's talk about how technology affects humanity, how humanity ultimately influences culture and culture itself shapes the technology we invest in. So Greg, welcome, super psyched to see you, my friend. Thank you. It's great to be here, Pete. Um, I really enjoyed uh, getting to know you when I worked when we both worked in the Department of Energy. So it's terrific to reconnect in this forum. Thanks for the invitation. You bet. You bet. And for our, our folks, that that'll come out a bit because uh, Greg has some incredibly amazing ties to the Department of Energy, the energy sector, and we're gonna kick it off that way. And and if if those of you listening today can bear with us, there will be some acronyms. There will be some references to some technical terms that we do hope you look up. For example, you can go Google Core Light right now and you're gonna see words like Zeek and Bro and ESNet and be like, what the heck? Well, the <laughs> tapestry will be woven and the storytelling will commence here in a minute. But, you know, Greg, um, I do want to brag a little bit. You know, you you served as the CEO uh, of Corelight from 2016 to 2020. Before joining Corelight, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, director for the Energy Sciences Network. And vote th for those of you who don't know what that is, that is arguably the most powerful uh, education R&D network, I would say globally, and it's recognized as such. Greg has a technical background, we'll go there, but the cool thing is he not only maintains a PhD from UC Berkeley, but also a degree from Harvard. Like me, he's got a little bit of that liberal arts in him, so it's probably what makes him such a compelling talker and speaker. Corelight, it's a provider of the industry's first open network detection and response platform. It's a capability service solution. It's got a lot packaged in it, and we'll, we'll hear a bit more about that. So for the cyber folks on the, on the uh, call, or should I say uh, participating today, you're going to learn a lot about the powerful nature of it, and we'll even blend in some of the discussions around open source. So, Greg, that's my best job introducing you. I'm going to now pivot back to you and say, hey, why don't you take us back to that journey where the idea of Corelight was born when you didn't know it was going to become a Corelight and, and some of those roots and really your journey and passion for what you're doing today. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm happy to tell the story and I'll try to do it crisply. I really expected Pete to spend my whole career in the Department of Energy System, especially the the Office of Science part of it. Um, I start. I just got very lucky. My first technical job was at LBNL, highly technical, uh, uh, you know, sort of frontline networking technician. And I worked my way up through the ranks. And I did that while I was finishing my PhD at Berkeley, as you said, in, in a liberal arts um, field. So I had the kind of beautiful and engrossing split brain experience of doing one thing with one part of the day and the other with another part. I had been a coder as a kid. And so the technical work came pretty easily. And I was just so inspired by the mission and the context around me. These were folks um, top of their scientific domains, whatever the domain was, trying to accelerate discovery and push the frontiers of human knowledge forward every day and doing it with real humility and real grace. Um, and I just was so inspired by that. I thought I would spend my career in that context. 
Um, and towards the end, I worked my way up into the role you described leading the mission network. Mission is a really important word to me. It may come out again in this conversation. Oh yeah. <laughs> but leading the mission network for the Department of Energy. So interconnecting the National Lab Complex, also the Nuclear Weapons Complex, which is managed by DOE, has a very different mission, different risk profile. And interconnecting that world with the global network of, of um, scientific instruments and scientists around the world arguably the best job in networking. And um, what, what happened to me was a little bit surprising, but I became a customer of a tiny predecessor company to CoreLife. It was providing services around an open source project that um, I was depending on. And in fact, the entire DOE was depending on for cybersecurity defensive purposes. At the time it was called Bro. It's mm -hmm. an open source project, it evolves. Uh, and it's been renamed Zeek. But if you try to learn about it, if you're inspired to learn about it after this interview, you may find both names being used. About two years ago, it was renamed Zeek. And it has become the kind of gold standard for making sense of network traffic. I was a networking person focused on network security and I needed some help. I got connected with the founders of this company, became the first customer and gradually just the bug bit me, the startup bug. Um, and over a period of about a year, I volunteered. I got permission from the lab to do that and finally took the big leap, much to the surprise of my wife and my family and my kids <laughs> and who were in college at the time, um, took the leap into become the second uh, employee for the startup and the first CEO. And so since then, we've been so fortunate and we've grown quite rapidly. Um, and I designed another role for myself that I think is a little bit more um, compatible with my own instincts and interests, this role that you've just described. But it's been a great, great ride. Um, I think we are, just as I was fulfilling a mission at DOE, I like to think I'm fulfilling a mission here at Corelight, which we can talk about. But, but that's the big story, is an unexpected leap and a happy one into startup land about four years ago. Well, Greg, that was, you're great, by the way. You're an awesome speaker. I'm actually uh, taking notes and uh, not just about what you're saying, but like do this next time. Greg is awesome. Um, you're very kind. No, no, no. Seriously, man, the, the prep calls leading up to this, we knew this would be a walk in the park. So we're going to have some fun. So, so now I'm going to do some filler on a lot of what you said that I wrote down that really resonated with me. And I know will with the audience again, smart cities, the anatomy of a smart city is a little bit of this, that, and then some. Yeah. It's the 16 sectors that DHS defines, right? At least in this country as those that we depend on. I think the actual definition, if I may, says that there are 16 critical infrastructure sectors whose quote, assets, systems, and networks, whether physical or virtual are considered to be so vital to the United States that their incapacitation or destruction would have a debilitating effect on security, national economic security, national public health, something we're living with today, or safety or any combination thereof. And this is captured in Presidential Policy Directive 21 titled Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience. I like to reference that, Greg, I know you know about it. The fact that you have this networking background, you spoke to risk and we'll get into risk mitigation because really this is leading up to what I hope is, while Greg Bell is amazingly awesome and a visionary and futurist and a, and a true academic, but also rolled up his sleeves kind of thought leader, you have something that companies and businesses should really take a look at to help secure that network. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. So, so um, when you talked about making sense of the traffic, I, I, I kind of want us to back bounce a bit here because another thing in threes I like to talk about, we want to educate, we want to inform, we want to enlighten. We want people yeah. to walk away saying, I know it's probably in a box or appliance or something, but we want people to understand today, at least our community in the super cluster, Greg, why should I care? So storytelling, as we talked, is going to be a big part of this. And oh, by the way, since I love numbers, um, depending upon where you read it, if you Google smart cities and five-year roadmap, um, they're projecting, and I've seen this in two different places, approximately $2.57 trillion market by 2025. Wow. And how are you protecting those billions and billions and billions of internet of things, industrial and of things devices is where I feel like the story of Corelight is so compelling for our group, which is why we're so excited to have you. So that's again, some context of if we geek out a bit, it's because the technology is so special and unique. And with that, I wanna go back to Corelight. Come on, this is your chance, cause I want you to, to pitch about why it's so unique and its value proposition. It's, um, Corelight is 
proposing that there's a new and better way to do security. So without getting too technical, um, the security landscape that I encountered when I was a buyer of security products for DOE, um, first of all, it was very scary. It peddled fear a lot, you know, mm. um, and you could see it even in the marketing, very aggressive uh, colors. The names of companies were very aggressive and hyper militarized. We think, and we're not alone in thinking this, but I think that um, we are doing our very best to propagate a different idea, which is a little more optimistic and data centric. So security is being transformed like a lot of fields that we understand um, in just our ordinary lives by data science, real-time collection and analysis of data. And that transformation is profound. Um, and we see it in our, we see it when we go to the doctor, right? We see it in lots of domains. It's, it's, um, I'm not saying anything that this audience doesn't know, but what you may be a little bit unfamiliar with is the transformation that's occurring in security as a result. What used to be this very complex landscape of thousands of companies and lots of little distinct product ideas um, can be greatly simplified if you think through this lens of just data. So if you think about security as a data-centric activity, you're, you're the first, from first principles, you need to ask yourself, what sorts of data can I have access to, to protect cyber infrastructure, to protect cities so we can promote the mission that cities have? And the answer is there's only a few. Um, there's really only a few, there's not a hundred. You can get data from computers themselves, from endpoints. You can get data from external sources of intelligence. Maybe it's the government or maybe it's companies that sell Intel and you can get data from the network itself. So what Corelight is doing is trying to focus entirely on that last kind of work, which is to take data coming from the, the network, whether that network is at the core of the internet or in a, a, a water processing plant or electrical utility substation, transform it into actionable information that helps cities and other organizations defend themselves more effectively, more quickly, more economically. So that's the high level pitch for Corelight. Yeah, but but that's a great pitch. And like I said, I think we can keep distilling down because I, I you know, part of what I like to do as a former data center, and I have a background in telecom like you, my, my mom, yeah. my mother always said, you know, you're going to appreciate, my mother's a, a, a retired surgeon. My father was an architect, God rest his soul. I couldn't dissect a worm to save my life. And I couldn't get a shot without freaking out, even if it was just a finger prick. Can't stand blood. So here I was like, what am I going to do? Well, I'll go be a liberal arts major. Somehow I end up a CTO. Um, so kindred spirits. But no, we're all technologists in this world. And I think for those watching, whether you know it's the I call it the Joe six pack, Joanne six pack to the academic. We always have an opportunity to learn and teach. And that's what's important since we carry around devices every day and we don't register with by reading terms of, of agreement. We just need it, use it, want it. And then when it doesn't work, we go, what the heck's going on? Or for God forbid, yeah. there's a cyber breach. This is the, again, to me, high level value proposition of core light. So, you know, back to to what you, you you just mentioned something and I actually have what I call my Gregism list. I have some things <laughs> you've said to me over the years that I love. And one of them I read and actually watched recently is you, you, you said, stabilizing the internet, making it defensible for all things that we care about. Yeah. Now that to me is the incredibly crystallized way of stating why a city should care about what you're investing in, how it's being deployed, and maybe just trust that the network will take care of itself. So yeah. that, and, and I want to pivot into the power of open source. So can you speak a little bit now to this idea of community driven back in the bro days to Zeke to how you've packaged it? Because you don't have to be a developer or a coder and feel like this is something I have to know to buy a core light appliance because you have sensors, right? You're talking about mm -hmm. sensors for various situations. I want to go back to some of that DNA and how it led to this powerful, powerful solution you've developed. Yep, open source is key to our identity and in some sense, our culture as a company is scientific and sci you can think of science as an open source project too. It's a meritocracy of ideas. That's kind, mm -hmm. of, that's kind of what open source is. Or if you want a less fancy way, I like to think of open source as a community potluck. Um, and everyone's gone to those, a neighborhood potluck where, um, you know, over time your neighbors will notice if you just bring plastic cups and nothing else and you drink all the wine. <laughs> so yeah. it, or whiskey, or whiskey. Yeah, okay. yeah. They'll notice an imbalance there. In, in an open source, it's a meritocracy that's um, driven by the quality of your contributions and your merit in the community. That model is incredibly powerful. It trans 
transcends all sorts of boundaries, national boundaries, political boundaries. It brings people together to tackle problems that are bigger than they could even dream of uh, tackling themselves. And there's something about networks and network security that really, that, that really, for me, want to call out for open source solutions. I think it's because the internet itself was a great kind of open source experiment because no one is really architecting the way internet peering works. Um, it's, it's sort of a bunch of local decisions being made. Protocols are developed in the open and very quickly the internet evolves very rapidly. And so for me in this part of the security world, the dynamism and the creativity that open source brings is really, really appropriate. And, and for us, it means that our customers, they can just ignore this and, and um, accept Corelight's enterprise solutions um, as is, and they'll get a great product. But if they want to participate in the community dimension of what we do, they can extend our data, they can um, build applications themselves that sit on our platform that do detections that are focused on their particular city or use case or sector, or they can work with other members of that same community to build such detections or maybe protocol parsers, or they can just leverage contributions by other companies. And in our community, I would say notably, Salesforce, uh, Verizon, Amazon, uh, MITRE, many other uh, large well-known organizations have made contributions um, to the open source project for which we're really grateful. It's a great virtuous cycle. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna uh, riff off a little bit of that. And just again, I'm gonna encourage folks uh, because we don't, we can talk for hours on use case. And I think that you've mentioned a couple of your technology partners and partnerships is a big part of this. And obviously I love uh, meritocracy of ideas. I love the community potluck. I'm gonna be stealing those, but giving total <laughs> attribution to you. <laughs> hey man, I love them, I love them. Um, the list keeps growing about Greg, Greg Bell and his greg -isms. Okay, so Greg, but listen, let's do this. Let's dial it back for a minute because okay. When I go to the website, as I did a couple times this week, and I was thinking, how can I break this down? Because I get that bro was bro, and that was renamed Zeke, and that's a yeah. neat little story. But when I see and hear open source, or when I hear open source, there's still that, at least in the Beltway too, which is why there's such a big push with DevSecOps now, and you have to explain, well, what's open source, what's freeware, what's shareware, what's not, what it is, is it secure? Is it when it gets to though the differentiator between true open source, you know what is known as Zeek, and then what Corelight has done to kind of package and fashion it, can you speak to maybe some of that? Uh, here's what you get uh, when you're buying a, a, an appliance. Because here's where I'm coming from. I work with utilities today. I work with transportation manufacturing uh, clients and the like. And and while they may appreciate what's on the inside, they just want to know. What should I buy? Make sure it doesn't bring down my network. And when I say, well, when, you're, when you look at a company like a Corelight, you're getting all this great DNA and this thought leadership, but they make something that yeah. while its roots might be an open source, they've made it a little extra special. And when I say that, you know, Greg, that's, that's me talking about um, what I love one of your white papers is seven reasons to switch from Zeek to the Corelight sensor. Can you talk about that and that value add of Corelight Sure. It, most companies that are monetizing open source projects today have what's called an open core business model. Okay. That, that's a little bit different from the classic Red Hat business model, but it's almost universal now for open source companies. And that means that they um, take an open source project. And in, in our case, all, all the committers actually to the Zeek project work for Corelight. So we're the custodian of the project financially, and we take that responsibility really seriously. And we continue to sustain that and make it better and better. And then around that, we build a shell of enterprise features and capabilities. And some of the organizations in the world that love our open source software just don't need or want the enterprise features. But the more and better a shell we make, and we've been working really hard to build very compelling capabilities, the more enterprises reach a different conclusion, which is that, you know, I love what's inside. I love the data and I love supporting the open source project, but I would like the easy button for deployment. And by the way, I need all sorts of integrations, certifications, capabilities that aren't really available in the open source project and, and just won't be. They're not really the destiny of the open source project to work on enterprise features. So we just have a nice feedback loop between a vibrant community and an enterprise, you know, a, folk, a company focused on enterprise sales that generates a revenue stream that supports the community. And that circle just continues if we're, if, if we're skillful in what we do. Um, but specifically, I, I will say with no offense to my co-founders in the company, Zeek, the open source project is a Unix power tool as it's sometimes called. It's a very 
it's it's a it's a bit it's incredibly powerful. It's a little little fearsome. It's a command line tool for those of you that are technical. Um, so there's no UI, there's no API, there's no web interface, there's no SaaS version, there's no streaming data export, there's no policy layer that lets you decide, hey, what kind of data is important to me? Um, a water processing plant or, or a utility. And there's no automatic export into other technologies like my SIM, Splunk or Elastic or whatever it might be. So we add all that and it's actually quite a bit. Um, and we focus on doing that you know, so effectively that our customers can take effort that used to be devoted to managing this fleet of sensors and re reallocate that effort to higher value activities, incident response, forensics, or even mission oriented activities, you know, that are beyond security and, and um, you know, speak a little bit to, to the mission, what, what a city is in the first place. Yeah, well, I, I, I have a lot of, of spiraling streams of consciousness happening. So let me pick one of those out. Um, again, it's a great white paper, folks, the seven reasons to the one you hit on right there was, um, and I, I couldn't help I was watching war games. Remember that movie war yes, games, yeah, sure. whopper the machine I was watching that over the Thanksgiving holiday. And I was thinking command line, there was Matthew Broderick, I'm like, Gosh, command line was like state of the art. Um, but but that was a great analogy, Greg, for those who were saying, look, you know, you can still use the power of Zeek, but not many people out there do that sort of thing. And when you're a federal agency, I feel as you know, the largest purchaser of IT in the world, 90, 90 world, 90 billion a year, R and D, $140 billion market. Look at the sectors. We're going back to smart cities, critical sectors. Uh, you know, this is a case, folks, where technology is underpinning those 16 sectors we talked about that provide the quality of life that every city, county, municipality worldwide needs so that sensors on traffic lights, sensors in cars, sensors in the oceans, you know, buoys, think tsunamis are, are working and can give us that uh, prescriptive and, and predictive uh, analytics. And, and, and again, this is a sensor we're talking about, not just this really smart guy in Greg Bell who knows how it all works behind the, under the wrapper. But I like the idea of making your existing SIM, you know, security information event management, for those of you who think it, it's just a word, it's actually an acronym, um, more powerful. And I think that that's a, a light bulb moment that I like to think is, is, is happening where it's not a replacement. Core light is, in my view, and tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong, Greg, because we're going to pivot to the, the pitch and some of the challenges you face and what you hope people who go to your website or give you a call don't predispose themselves to thinking, oh, this is just like some, some other cyber tool that I have. I think it's a complementary sensor that will give you that actionable implied intelligence so you can automate where needed, but still rely on human intuition. Tell me I'm right or wrong. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. And it is typically when when we're selling to customers, they've already made it, they've already kind of fallen in love with the data we provide. We can talk about why, but effectively it makes the vital work in the security operations center, um, incident response, threat hunting, forensics a lot faster. So they've fallen in love with the data. They've decided it's better than legacy data sources, which are just a little too um, problematic for modern security problems. Uh, and they turn to us for um, a commercial version of it. It's highly complementary to other, um, other pieces of the security landscape that a CISO, for instance, would think about. And in fact, the, the, actually, I think one of the best and simplest um, security ideas to come out from Gartner in a while is the idea of the SOC triad. So um, Gartner's really simplified the landscape. There's a, there's a SIM, as you just described, for aggregating data, doing searching, that's kind of where the workflow lives. And there's data that comes from endpoints and data that comes from networks. And we, as I explained before, we, we, we're, not, we're not handling endpoint security, we're providing data that's highly complementary to it. When you think about to this audience, um, the importance of network data, network derived data is really on the rise, I think, because the number of unmanaged and probably unmanageable internet connected devices is rising just so rapidly. Um, they're embedded everywhere in our homes, in our factories, in our streets, in our bridges, and all sorts of infrastructure. And they speak the internet protocol, IP, or TCP IP. Um, yep. They can be compromised. They're running little embedded operating systems, Linux or something else. And the only way we can really understand um, 
if they're healthy or they're compromised is to monitor the network traffic that they produce because they're unlikely to be managed through uh, endpoint detection technology. Um, and I think the number of those devices and the ratio between those sorts of devices and devices like my laptop is, is changing very rapidly. And for that reason, people are really focusing more and more on solutions like Corelight that try to make sense of network data. Yeah, I think the making sense of network data is something that makes sense, right? And 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 in the government inside the Beltway, we have the 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 federal data strategy, which speaks to leveraging data as a strategic ad, asset. Um, yeah. Nobody's going to argue that. So what, what, why we have data.gov is put the information out there, let somebody do something with it so that it can make sense for us. And a lot of people um, view that sometimes here inside the Beltway as you know, oh, jobs are being taken away because technology is going to take over. I say, let the cloud run 24 seven, no more five nines, but uptimes there. Let it create because it likes to run. It doesn't need caffeine, just power, mind you. Um, and then let the, the human intellect look at and still use the most powerful brain on earth, which is the brain, um, powerful network on earth. And, and, and then we can still make decisions. That's what speaks to the 21st century workforce. So bringing it back a little bit to something you mentioned about um, aggregation and network derived data. Um, coming from um, a recent article I read, it was Smart Cities World or Die, forgive me those uh, under, awesome publications. Smart cities are cities built on smart and intelligent solutions and technology that will lead to the adoption of at least five to eight of, which I will announce, smart parameters. These include smart energy, smart buildings, smart mobility, smart healthcare, smart infrastructure, smart technology, smart governance, and smart education and the smart citizen. So when I hear smart cities, right, a city is made up of all of those components. And to me, when you talk about sensors, the next co comment was, or statement was, the rise of smart cities has created growth opportunities for sensor makers. Mm -hmm. There are electronic sensors, there are infrared sensors, there's thermal sensors, there's proximity and LIDAR sensors. There's, so, so, you know, can we talk just for a New York minute here, um, Greg, about um, the, the sensor component, the sensing and, and how important um, maybe this isn't the secret sauce, but when I think about the buyer of CoreLight, can you give us a, today, a typical CoreLight buyer is this type of business? Because again, the global audience we have, I don't want people thinking, oh, I'll just run down to Best Buy and get a CoreLight sensor. Right. Or are they there? Give us a typical buyer of your solution. Yep, for our solution today, this may change over time as we grow because our ambitions are, are large, um, but our typical buyer now is a global 2000 company and one that has a fair amount of risk to manage. So that's nation state risk, reputational risk, infrastructure risk, financial risk, and they invest a large proportion of their IT budget in security. And in fact, a large proportion of their discretionary budget in IT. Um, they've got a SOC, a security operations center. They've got people for whom data and high quality data makes a big, big difference. So this isn't the mom and pop, you know, donut store. Uh, and, and this is probably not a medium sized business yet. This is a business with a, or an organization or an entity with a big physical footprint uh, and a lot of risk. And those are our natural customers today. Uh, and, you know, it shouldn't be surprising some unusually high percentage of those customers are in government for us, unusually high for a startup um, because of the deployed footprint of our open source project, both in the federal government uh, in the US and in um, US allies around the world. So um, that, that's, that sort of is a quick description. In the end, you know, data is a bit abstract. It comes down to how people use it and how it changes their workflows and their lives. And that's sort of the really interesting part for folks working in the jobs I described, trying to figure out what's happening in the heat of battle and the cybersecurity incident, our data helps them move quicker. And that's kind of where it, our buyers are people who have those sorts of employees trying to be faster and better, um, not, not organizations that are say outsourcing security. Um, we'll, we'll get to the, those eventually, but our core buyer is, is the larger organizations. I yeah, I, I think of the world that I've been um, part of, not just a DOE, but post, and that's this utility. People think utilities, oh, yeah. it's energy. Well, there's water utilities, there's telecom utilities, operational technology and this convergence of, you brought up IP, the internet protocol and the internet of things. I've always said, you know, folks say, oh, I get IoT and I go, yeah, threat landscape expanded, more things at the edge, things in the cloud, more opportunity. Now we need to have more information at our fingertips. And while the 
volume, velocity, variety, and even veracity of data that's out there, you know, it's, it's companies like yours that are saying, hey, but we can also help make sense, work with the products you have so that you can have that, that intelligence. So I get that. I am going to kind of throw you a curveball, not intentional, but I really was struck by the MITRE ATT&CK framework um, yeah. sort of affiliation. Can you speak to it, what it is and how and why Correlate together with MITRE have really kind of created this pretty cool optic of the world? Yeah, Cyber um, and my, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is this, it's kind of, um, it's this new way of thinking about the process of attacking and compromising organizations. Um, and especially the, the process of sort of lateral movement of getting into an organization, lurking there, doing reconnaissance, figuring out what's a juicy target and moving around. Um, there wasn't really a rich um, framework for describing what attackers do. MITRE produced one a few years ago and it's really had a viral popularity. Um, the, I've been um, participating in MITRE attack conferences and I've been really um, happy to see that great organization make such another big, big imprint on the cybersecurity landscape. Many companies are mapping their own products onto the concepts of the MITRE attack framework and Corelight included, just because it's a, it's a, a really straightforward and sensible way to, to sort of understand um, the typology of a cybersecurity attack. Um, not every little, it's, it's a two dimensional grid and it's, I won't go into great detail and not every part of it is relevant to network derived data, but a lot of it is. And for those parts, we really wanna map onto the framework so people can understand our value prop. Yeah, that, that helps me a little bit because when I was reading it, I was just drilling down and drilling down and drilling down. And then it finally hit me. It was like, you know, for the geeks out there, and I mean that with all due respect or with respect, um, yeah. tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs, yeah. a very commonly used, again, better acronym than actually having to say it, um, yeah. is something we log and we collect. And, and again, those folks, Greg, that you talked about, those individuals, those machines that are behind the scenes, much like Spectrum, we don't see it, it's just, it's there. We have people working in these organizations, your typical purchaser of, that is just like, they know why they need a core light sensor and what it can do. And then as long as the C level and whoever's saying the network's up and running, we're happy. It's, it's nice to know that, that somebody's managing that. I thought that uh, for me, it was while, you know, frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK, um, I think the phrase was, you know, while there's no silver bullets out there, core light is something that helps fill some of those gaps. And again, it shows the value of a complementary component that, uh, again, I think is pretty neat and why we love featuring companies like yours, um, large, small, entrepreneurial in this smart city, smart city discussion. Um, Okay, so now we're going to pivot a little bit into, you know, Greg, the, the futurist in you, the visionary. I mean, you, you know, I guess, can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, being the CEO and then saying, okay, now I want to be the chief, or I'm going to be the chief strategy officer. What yeah. drove that? To me, I hear he wanted to get back into, was it rolling up sleeves, getting out there with the people, but this is about you now and sort of your journey, okay? Where you came from, Berkeley, fine, great company, started it, you're an awesome dude, badass, as I like to say, but man, you're CEO and you're now the chief, you know, growth or chief strategy officer. What's that migration to, or should I say, um, repositioning of you and your passion? And then where do you see yourself in the next few years going? Yeah, great question. It's a bit of an unusual move, not unprecedented, but for Silicon Valley CEOs to say, hey, maybe we're getting to a stage in our growth where we might want to hire someone with a different set of qualities to lead the company. Hmm. But I began to think that as we, as so much of what needed to be done was focused on scalable, what's called go-to-market. So just the combination of marketing and sales, it's not at all straightforward. Um, expertise and good pattern recognition make all the difference in the world. And I want the very best for the company. I felt like I probably was doing a fine job and could have figured it out. Um, but it might be better to imagine a role that, um, for me, it's like start like like um, imagining a role that's a bit more like the early days of the company, um, focusing on challenges that were almost impossible, which I really am energized by. Um, and a lot of those connect with the open source um, heritage that we have. I came from the open source community and I really wanted to spend um, more of my time kind of devoted to open source community engagement and, and also thinking about the development. So a big part of my job is just focusing on the open source side of our business. 
Um, I went through this amazing, I thought, process of articulating a job description, hiring a firm to help me find a great CEO successor, and advertising uh, discreetly. I interviewed, a, oh, probably 30 really prominent cybersecurity executives. So I, my personal network expanded greatly. Um, it was fascinating. And ended up choosing our beloved chief product officer, Brian Dye, who had run very large organizations in the past before he decided to join Corelight around our Series B. He's... he's um, just ferociously smart, high integrity, a great products thinker and is doing a fantastic job. In fact, we just closed out our third quarter, record quarter. And then we started with the first couple of weeks in the fourth quarter being a record as well for a, for a given period of time. So he's doing great. And I moved into thinking about community, corporate development, which is high level relationships and personal relationships with large, larger companies and technical alliances. And for me, that triad of responsibilities speaks to me and I like it. And I'm just very grateful that the board and the, my co-founders and everyone in the company sort of, after listening to my argument agreed, this is probably a good evolution. And I think it was a good choice, but it's a, it's a bit unusual. So you, you touched on Brian and actually that's not a, this wasn't scripted folks, segue. Can you talk a bit about, cause culture is everything, yeah. the company. Can you just describe a how you're, you know, are you remote? Are you in one place? How did, what is the culture? Uh, you mentioned Red Hat early. Red Hat preaches culture, 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 culture. You almost forget that open source is their DNA or yeah. that. What is the culture like? What, what's, what's a day in the life of, of Greg when he wakes up and he thinks about this incredible company he works with and leads? Well, it's a topic I kind of obsess over, but I do think, um, and it's the water you swim in culture. You don't always know what's distinct about it. You often learn what's distinct from the new people who come into the company and express their surprise at this or that. But to the extent that we try to reinforce and engineer it, it, it is very similar to the culture you might've encountered at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab where I spent so much of my time. And I'd say it's um, scientific, so it's, it's data-based. Um, it's humble. Not everyone at LBNL, to be honest, was perfectly humble, but some of, but, but there was a culture of, I would say, humble ambition there that I really, really respect. Like we're not, we're not above any task. We're not above any relationship. We'll help the, we'll help interns, even if we have won a Nobel Prize. That's the kind of vibe that I really appreciated, especially for some of the leading scientists like Saul Perlmutter, the Nobel Prize winner at LBNL, just exudes that decency, um, service. And we tried to bring that combination of sort of um, ambition, but humility and data centrism into the company. And we, there's, there's an unusual degree of transparency in the company, flatness in the org structure, access to information, low drama. And I just dearly hope we can maintain that as we scale. We're about 160 people. We're planning to be about 300 at the end of next year. So we're growing very rapidly. And it's one of my primary goals to make sure that we build the rituals and training and enablement so that this, this culture grows with us. So thank you. And, and again, place that I would imagine anybody watching and listening is like, where can I go get a job? I want to work there. <laughs> um, it's leadership focused and uh, leadership focus. And I also just appreciate that because Greg, I, I felt that when we first you know, started reconnecting post DOE. And I, I again, commend you for, for doing what you do in your team there. Um, I still think of you though, as thinking forward. You're, you are defined futurist. Um, what are some of the technologies that you think about today? Like somebody asked me this the other day, and of course I bring up, you know, internet of things and remote communications and all that. And you, you know, maybe I leave it at that because I, I think I'm creative to a point, but can you speak to just off the cuff here? What do you think some of the technologies of the future are um, and how you think they're gonna change the world putting on that futurist hat? Yeah, I'm happy to. And Pete, then I have to, full disclosure, I'm not a bona fide futurist for sure. I've known some of them in, the, in, in my r and &E work, folks like Larry Smarr, who, who think comprehensively about the future across all domains. I've got a sort of narrow view, I think more network centric, yeah. but- Maybe um, with a little F. Yeah. Futures with a little left. Let's just call <laughs> it that. Futurism. I respect what you're saying, brother, but uh, visionary futurist thought leader, just come on. What do you think is going to change? Well, I know people are thinking what's going on in that guy's brain. Well, so let's take a network centric view first. I think um, the, the foundational role of networks in our lives will only increase. And I think the COVID experience has accelerated that. It's not, it's a truism. A lot of people um, have grasped already. I used to say when I was fortunate to be director of ESNet that um, I would go to a networking conference and say, well, 
I would begin a provocative talk by saying networks don't matter. They really don't. What matters is the service they provide. And that service is to make geography irrelevant. That's the, the fundamental service of a network is to render geography irrelevant. And mm. what, what better illustration than this conversation, right? Or yeah. the, the fact that hundreds of people can gather around us and listen to it. So that, um, that foundational service that networks provide is just being distributed everywhere. 5G is one example. Um, you know, satellite delivered broadband to rural communities or wireless delivered broadband to rural communities is another. The fabric of connectivity um, will knit us together, you know, closer, more closely and closely, and we'll stop thinking about it. And, our, and kids will be born who never had an experience of geography being an impediment at all, which is just massively exciting and also a little strange, to be honest. Um, so I think, you know, I would say, um, new modes of delivering broadband ubiquitously at very high speed with all of the sort of service delivery potential that provides, medical service delivery being a fantastic example, the democratization that that can affect, um, the ability to let people live where they want um, and to assemble cities of medium size, not massive size, that are transformational and to provide better quality of life. 5G is part of that as well. The, the impact of 5G has been well discussed, I think in your series as well. But I would, but I, I think the transformation of rural communities, tribal communities previously, and inner city communities that have been poorly served um, will accelerate as a result of COVID. That's just a few thoughts. Um, hey, listen, few, you've given me material to say like, look, uh, I never would have been able to articulate it that eloquently because you're right, you nailed it. You talked about, you know, the future state of, of what we believe the world is just every day evolving to. And we can't joke. I like to talk about when they invented the internet, they said, yeah, 4.3 billion IP addresses is going to be plenty. And now it's IPv6, which those geeks out there know is like this 340 undecillion are needed and it's yeah. probably not enough, but uh, stuff's talking to stuff and it's amazing how it's having impact on things like you said, precision medicine and farming and the like. Okay. Two more questions. And one of them's the parting shot. I know we're coming up to the end here, but um, I do like to, just because hearing your story and as we geeked out a bit, it's an amazing story. And again, I, I'm so excited to have had an opportunity to feature you in Corelight. Um, what would you be doing if you weren't doing this though? Like where was the linchpin of the, I think I'm gonna go all in on this Berkeley thing. I mean, what would you be doing if right now it was, Greg, you're not allowed to do it anymore. You've, done, you've been there, done that, we're passing the torch. What would you go do? Gosh, um, what I do with my, I, I have, um, I have a, strange, maybe pathological need to always be on a steep learning curve. So I'd probably be doing something different. Right now, I'm spending a lot of time um, trying to learn to make music, for instance. So oh. it's, it's a little more inward than, than the things we've been discussing. Um, but in my life, I've run, um, even before grad school, I ran a refugee services and gang prevention organization. I've worked for Amnesty International. I've been a teacher when I was a grad student at Berkeley. I think all the through line aside from music and art is probably some mission orientation and some connection pretty close to a university. So the honest answer is I'd probably be within a stone's throw of a university trying to build some mission oriented tribe to go forth and do and make an impact because that really, really excites me even on a bad day in a, in a job like that, you wake up um, and you know that it's worth doing. So I, I, that's a little non-specific, but I think those are the, um, the outlines of what I might be doing if I'm not doing this. Okay, and now I'm sorry, I actually have one more because I love that side of it, humanizing the great, the wonderful Greg Bell, the wonderful Greg <laughs> Bell. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's an amazing, amazing passion you maintain. And I think, again, that's what's probably led to a lot of your success is just having that, that idea that there's more than just this. So um, the question is, uh, what's the one thing you wish you would have known when you began your career that you know now? That's a classic question because you've been yeah. on this journey. Like, what would you be doing? Not different, yeah. but what would you wish you would have known? I might've tried the startup journey a bit earlier. I think I was impeded a little bit because I was in love with the mission at DOE. And I, and I also thought maybe I didn't have transferable skills, but in fact, it's incredibly exciting. A lot of what I learned in the federal space about ambition and focus from, my, from peers who were actually scientist transfers. A lot of what I learned in other domains, the ability to write well, read a lot quickly, teach, the ability to speak are all highly transferable and kind of rare. So I, I probably 
probably would have had another startup in me. Right now, I don't. I'm really totally focused on Core Life, but I've loved it so much. For the most part, I might have started earlier. Well, I love it because I'm a guy that took a leap of faith and left government yep. after 25 years, hung a shingle called Dots and Bridges and was just like, I'm going to trust that something up here is going to get me where I need to be. And, and mine was always, it still is, is stop trying to, you can't be the smartest guy in the room, but yeah, you, you, right. you can, you can, you know, lean on those amazing people and folks like you, who I consider a, not just a colleague, but a pal and a friend and someone I know I can call and say, explain this to me. Okay. So here's the final one. It's the parting shot. And I'm going to suck about 10 seconds out of the air for you to think about it. It's really, what do you want to leave with this audience? You know, we talked about smart cities. We talked about technology. We talked about, you know, how you built core light and its roots. What's something, you know, in the spirit of your authenticity, your humility, your curiosity, what makes you you? This is as much about a thought leader, folks, as it is an inventor, an entrepreneur, a leader, and someone who's changing the world. Um, you know, Greg, you've said a lot of it. I don't know what's left in that, you know, tweetable <laughs> think tank of yours. But uh, yeah, what would you like to leave in 30 seconds or less? Well, I, I've been pretty aspirational on some of the things I've said, maybe a bit a little more concrete here, especially folks here maybe want um, a, a to do. Um, there really is a better way to think about security and to do security. The old fashioned sort of black box fear centric security mode is just not appropriate for the challenges moving forward, especially the challenges in the context we're talking about. So um, think about data centrism and security. Um, think about what the sources of the data you might need to defend your institutions and infrastructures might be. And if you're a, if, if you're a big organization with the kind of risk profile I described, we'd be happy to talk to you about that in a, in a pretty low pressure way. Give us a call or send me a note. I'm Greg at Corelight. I'm very accessible. Um, but the, but we, don't need to be, we don't need to give up on cybersecurity. It's a hard problem, but it's tractable. And we need to, um, you know, we, we can't not build the great infrastructure of the future because we're too afraid. We shouldn't be driven by fear. We should be driven by optimism, data centrism, and hope. That might have been more than 30 seconds. But. No, no, no. I, I don't care. I just say that because I know people at least double it, but at least it's good. No, great parting shot. Uh, you know, Greg, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sure. We will be talking again. He mentioned you preempted me. You know, reach out to Greg. Greg at Core, is it Greg at Corelight.com? Greg at .com. Okay. Yeah. Check out their website, folks, Corelight.com, www, great company. You can always follow back up with me. I can help get you in touch with 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 Greg and 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 the incredible group out there. But Greg, look, thank you again. You, you embody the tenets of what not only connecting dots, building bridges, and I like to call generating light bulb moments is all about. Uh, our community at smart within the smart city space. I can speak for my co-chair, who you met, Mr. Uh, Ian Magazine up at Carnegie Mellon. We thank you. Um, we will keep you included as we move forward, and we're excited to uh, to talk again soon and see how you're taking Correlate just to another level. So thanks, pal. Thank you so much. That was terrific, Pete. Thank you, you got it, brother.